So the next topic we're going to cover are various ways of implementing singletons that work correctly in multi-threaded programs. And we're actually going to look at two different variants. One of the variants uses the double-checked locking pattern using Java's volatile variable technique. And the other approach is going to be using an atomic reference. And both of these topics are somewhat esoteric, but they're fun and it helps to deepen your understanding of memory models and concurrency and uh, various ways of getting atomicity in low-level parts of, of Java libraries and, and application code. So let's go ahead and share our screen. This particular example is in the EX28 folder. Here's the code. So as I mentioned, this basically is showing off how to implement the singleton pattern to work in a multi-thread environment using a couple different techniques. Now, first of all, just to put a, a topic to rest, yes, I'm aware that the singleton pattern is the, the go-to of patterns, right? It, it has a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of haters out there who don't like singleton. I'm, I'm not a huge proponent of singleton. There are times when it, it's very useful. The point here is not to debate whether singleton's good or not. It's to explain if you use it in a multi-threaded environment, how can you make sure it works properly? And a, a good place to learn about why this is a problem is to go out to the internet and search for double-checked locking pattern. And uh, let's get rid of the Java singleton part. If you just look up double-checked locking, you will come to this Wikipedia link. And there's a whole bunch of discussion about double-checked locking. Double check locking actually got its name and its start from a paper that, that I wrote back in, I think it was 1997 or so, when I was a professor at Washington University. And I discovered some weird problems were going on with the singleton pattern when used in multi threaded environments. And I wrote the double check locking optimization pattern as a description of how to get around these problems. And if you take a look somewhere, you can find my paper on it originally. And this paper, this topic also appears in the Pattern Oriented Software Architecture Volume 2 book that I was the co-author for. Uh, well, as it turned out, this pattern triggered a whole firestorm of controversy, particularly in Java, and particularly with respect to Java memory management semantics and memory model semantics. And there's all kinds of discussions that go on and on and on about this. Um, the long and the short of it is, you know, skipping over about a decade worth of, of uh, <laughs> very polemic and passionate debate, the Java community finally decided they would integrate support for double-check locking into the Java virtual machine. And so starting in Java 1.5 or JDK 5 or however you number it, which I think was in 2004 or so, they had direct support for that. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be showing how to use those mechanisms. First, let me just remind you how you use a singleton. What you do is you want to make sure there's only one instance of an object and have a global entry point to get to the object, but not use global variables. So here you can see we use canonical singleton syntax. We say singleton.instance, and then we can call fields or set fields, get fields on that one and only instance. So we can set the field to say 100. We can get the field, print it out. We can go ahead and have a different singleton with a different implementation, set the field, get the field. And the problem is that singleton out of the box is not thread safe, so you can have all kinds of weird problems. So these examples demonstrate how to do thread safe singletons. And you can see it, this example is very, very simple, but it just shows that you get these results. Okay, so let's go take a look at the two different ways to do this. The two different ways are either by using volatile variables in Java, in Java 5 or later, in conjunction with the double check locking optimization pattern, or an atomic reference. And there are other examples of ways to do it as well. If you go to the double check locking Wikipedia link, you'll find lots of other explanations of how to do this in Java and other languages. So here's the way to do it with a volatile variable and the double check locking optimization pattern in Java 1.5 and beyond. So you go ahead and make yourself a static field, which is the one and only instance of the singleton. And we make that volatile, very important to have volatile there. And then we can define a bunch of other non-static fields that'll be accessed through the singleton object. And then here's the method, here's the entry point into our singletonness called instance. And what we do is we come along here and we make a copy of the volatile singleton. So we copy the reference. So we now have a local variable called inst, which is a copy to the singleton, which is up here. 
And that value is either going to be null or non-null. And because it's volatile, it's atomically null or non-null. So then we go ahead and we check to see whether inst is equal to null. And notice there's no locking here. And so we're relying on the fact that reading a volatile is an atomic operation. So the first time in, then inst will be null, in which case we're then going to have to go ahead and synchronize on some mutex, in this case, the singleton v.class object, because every Java object has a class object associated with it, and there's one of them. So we're going to synchronize on that. Then we're going to go ahead and reread the singleton again with another volatile read. And at this point, we perform the second check. So this is the double check in the double check locking. And if inst is still null, it means we're the first time we've gotten through here. And then we go ahead and make ourselves the one and only singleton. We assign it to inst, and then we assign it to s singleton. That's an atomic right. And then we fall out of the if statement, and we return inst. So either inst was already non-null atomically when we came in here, in which case we're just returning a previously initialized value, or the first time in, it was null, and then we went ahead and synchronized. So only one thread, if there were multiple threads, will be doing this initialization of the singleton. There's only one at a time is going to be doing that. So that's why it's the double check locking optimization pattern. Checks it twice the first time in. So that's how you do it with volatile. And I like this approach. It's very clean. It generalizes to other kinds of things. I find it easy to understand. Um, there's other ways of doing it in Java that don't require using volatile, but this is one cool way to do it. Now let's go ahead and take a look at another way to do it. This is a way that uses a so-called atomic reference. An atomic reference is one of those atomics classes like atomic long, atomic boolean, atomic integer, and so on. And except that atomic reference can work on arbitrary objects, not just ints or longs. So what we're going to do here is we're going to define ourselves a static field called S singleton AR for atomic reference. And we're going to give it an initialization of a, uh, a null. And I guess I can get rid of that because I don't need it. Um, so it's going to start out being atomically initialized to null. And an atomic reference, as we'll see, has some certain cool properties that we can do for essentially compare and swap-like operations. We're then going to define some non-static fields. I just have one here, but I can have many. We have setters and getters for them. So here's the instance method for the singleton AR implementation of this stuff. So this is the uh, variant for atomic references. When we come into instance, the first thing we do, without any other locks being held, is we get the current value of the singleton, which could start out being null. So that may be a null read. If it is a null read, then we know that we haven't been initialized yet. So we come in here and we go ahead and make ourselves an instance of singleton AR. Now here's where things diverge a bit from the double check locking version of this pattern. This version of the pattern will, in fact, atomically assign an instance of singleton AR properly, but we can have multiple calls to the constructor because multiple threads could all come through simultaneously and find that singleton was null. So this particular approach only works if you're comfortable having your constructors called more than once. If constructors are no-ops, it doesn't matter. If your constructors do something more interesting, then, of course, you have to be careful, especially if they have side effects. So we get back a singleton here, which is one of these guys. And then we come down and we call the compare and set method, which is basically an atomic compare and swap operation. That's how it's implemented under the hood using low-level Java memory mem management primitives like compare and swap. And what that does is it says, if the current value of S singleton AR is null, then go ahead and set the newly allocated singleton atomically. So we're guaranteed that that will be done once and it'll be done correctly. And if any other thread comes through, only the first one will succeed. And you know you succeed if you get a true back, which meant it worked. If you get false back, that meant you weren't the first one in. In that case, we know that the singleton's been initialized, so we go ahead and simply do a get call to get the latest value or the current value of the singleton. In any event, when we're all done, we return the singleton's current value. So once again, really cool little technique. The downside, of course, is you can only have, uh, you have to be 
aware of the fact that your, your constructor could be called multiple times. In contrast, the version that's over here, the one for singleton V, that does not have that property. So this will guarantee that the constructor is only called one time. So it's a little bit more complicated because we have to use the volatile and the double check and so on. But the nice part is that the semantics are more coherent because you don't have to worry about constructors that will do things incorrectly if they have side effects. Okay, so that was just a simple, fun little example kind of talking about some rather esoteric aspects of Java synchronization and how they interact, interact with the memory model that you've got with Java. So let's go ahead and see if there's any questions about this topic. So uh, Java guarantees a single initialization of a static field. Yeah, that's, that's what's called the, the lazy holder um, initialization approach. And that's actually described also in the double check locking optimization page. It's another variant of how to get an initialized singleton, but or an initialized variable that's only got one value. So uh, um, let's see. So um, the main, about the only reason I can think of, of ever wanting to do something like this is that this version of singleton is a bit more dynamic. So the other version does it on load time. Um, I've thought long and hard about that and, and haven't really found a lot of use cases where singleton is more effective than lazy holder. I guess probably the main thing would be if you're porting code from another language that's not Java and you use singletons, it's a more straightforward way to port your code um, because your other code, of course, wasn't going to be taking advantage of Java's lazy holder model. And so you'd have to do some additional rework. But um, just to be complete, let's go ahead over here because I mentioned this, and let's go look at double check locking optimization. You can see this. And uh, I think somewhere in here, they show the lazy holder thing. Yeah, here we go, it's, it's in here. Um, so you can take a look, and, and I think this is the lazy holder model. There's a bunch of different ways to do that. And then there's also this newer, concept called var handles, which is yet another uh, interesting mechanism that is an attempt at trying to get away from having to use the low level compare and swap operations that you would find in Java unsafe class. And uh, this is yet another way of being able to do these kinds of things using var handles. So there's many different ways to skin a cat, as people like to say. Um, Oh, another question, why do we use copy inst? What's the problem if we don't use the copy? So let's see, uh, I'll go back and take a look at the code that goes along with that so you can see what question refers to. Let's go share the, here we go. So it's this part here. Um, that's just the recommended way to get this thing to work. Uh, so to, to find out the, the answer to why it works that way, you'd probably have to uh, send an email to Doug Lee, but uh, they decided that was the pattern that they wanted to follow. I'm not sure if it has to do with some optimizations or trying to teach the, the JVM to be smart about optimizing things, but you have to do this. So you're doing atomic read here. Now you're checking with the atomic read there. And then here we do another atomic read. So it's, it's probably to force an atomic read of this static variable that otherwise might be cached. And so therefore we wanna make sure that we, we get it read properly. That, that's my guess. But uh, again, Doug Lee would know, he's the, he's the expert on all that. 